Gary Nottingham, Experiments in Necromantic Rituals. Well, thank you, Jamie, and I'm uh, pleased to be here with you all. Firstly, I think we need to remember that uh, the dead, like the poor, are always with us. They're never far away, and at certain times of the year, they're perhaps more closer than what uh, you us may actually appreciate, and indeed, be actually comfortable with. Um, I want to talk to you about um, two necromantic rituals um, that I performed, um, one at All Hallows 1997, um, summoning the shade of my old teacher, Rosemary Bruce, who preferred to be known as Roz, and now I'm referred to as Roz. I should tell you how I work with um, Paul Hewson's Necromantic Rituals in Mastering Witchcraft, a much maligned book, one of the few books on magic that you can work reading. Uh, not an advert for his book, but uh, I like to add. And my second working was in 2004. Uh, this time it was different. I was in the Powers Castle in Wales and got the summoning of my great grandmother Emma King, who I refer to as Emma. Uh, that was done differently and based more on my own experiences of working with conjuration, remorse, ghost spirits, and John Dees and the system. Although it was a different ritual and it wasn't harsh as a diabetic conjuration was. She was my great grandmother, or rather should I say, she is my great grandmother, and um, I, I felt rather the politeness as I was asking this. So it was a different ritual. It was a lot harder. Uh, it was a lot more demanding. It went on for a lot more. In both cases, um, both results, that which I wanted to know about, uh, all happened. There were a series of events that happened afterwards, which I will uh, run through with you. I felt I had very good reasons for wanting to work these two rituals. I'm not going to go into those because whilst I mean no disrespect in the damn business. <laughs> um, just putting that aspect on one side. Um, firstly, last week Al um, touched on some depth about necromancy. Covered one or two bits I was going to say. He did far better than I would have done. So um, I will leave that as I said. But what I'm going to start with is uh, there was one that was published back in the 1990s, uh, Richard Kaikapa, as you may know the book, uh, Necromancer's uh, Manual, 15th century, uh, Bin Rights. It's a manuscript that was found in the library in an archive in Germany, as I understand. Um, interesting work, very interesting work, more useful material than that. However, putting that aspect on one side, I refer to that because he talks about, in, in the book, that necromancy, basically, in the Middle Ages, was deemed to be working magic via the dead. And he can touch upon it. But I, I, I look at it, I think, well, necro, you know, you, you, you look at it as uh, referring to the dead, mancy, you look at it as referring to uh, divination. Uh, so in some sense, the name suggests divination by the dead. But in the Middle, Age, Middle Ages, as I understand, Kai Kepper, it was a necromancer, was simply the word magic, the word magic, the word of the dead, the word of the that's how magic can be done. Um, when we move forward in time, we uh, look at Reginald Scott's uh, work, which was touched upon in my uh, all time favourites. I mean, Scott, first of all, talks in some depth about necromancy and uh, getting somebody to what they uh, when they're dying, to, to basically be as we refer to the National Butler, <laughs> the right way of putting it. Um, he goes into some depth about that. Well, I don't know anybody who's ever tried that, but it's um, not what I'm prepared for personally. And some dead people are rather disappeared off and then come back. Um, I don't know how you feel about that one. Um, however, having said that, Scott, when he wrote the book, 
I've just seen a Scott Squire from Kent, JP, written to debunk witchcraft, which is magic, which there was a hell of a lot going on in recent times, perhaps more so than what we actually realised. Um, but the book, reprinted 13 times, which just goes to show how popular it became. And whilst he wrote it to debunk witchcraft, there was so much useful information in there, people were actually buying it to read it, which rather defeated the optic in some respect. Indeed. Some of the material in there has turned up in my own researches in Mid Wales and along the border I live in Shropshire. Um, the farms, the charms and bits and pieces, and this is in archives like our address with the National Library of Wales. And it's quite I'm quite intrigued actually how his work found its way up in Mid Wales and Shropshire in the safari communities hundreds of years ago. Hundreds of years ago. And that the um, you know the tradition has worked and it's been carried on. Um, but when we think of necromancy, the business of summoning the dead, you know, we, we, we all have these ideas, like we just saw a picture of um, Don earlier, um, Edward Kelly, or like the person I respect, Sir Edward Kelly, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Sir Edward. After all, without Sir Edward, have been uh, knocking, it, knocking the system of magic, basically. Um, but if you remember the picture that we saw, he's uh, in the churchyard in Lancashire um, with uh, Paul, somebody or other, and I can't remember what his surname was, and I did so. That's one, Paul Weaver. Uh, sometimes you'll see the picture uh, filled as uh, Ed Kelly and Dr. John Dean, who wasn't Dean, it was uh, Kelly's mate. But if you look at the picture in detail, there's two or three things that, are, that, that you'll notice. Uh, you've got the moon on the last quarter uh, in the picture, suggestive of the fact that this is the best time to work in necromantic rituals and working with the dead. You see the church clocks at midnight, that magical hour, between times, another intention. And he's also using a circle that's based on some of the material that was in the hexameter, uh, quite closely. Um, now, look, looking, looking at this, there's, there's, there's clues there on how to go about working with this material. But um, what I want to move on to is, a little bit go much further, is, is a little bit Levi in Transcendental Magic. You know, you've all read the book, you've all worn the jeans. Uh, so, Levi has this story where, I think it's 1854, he comes up to England, and he's uh, tied up with Paul Lytton, and he's involved in summoning the spirit, spirit of Polonius of Tyria. In case anybody didn't know, he was one of the great wonder workers uh, about the time of Jesus Christ, thereabouts, um, vegetarian, most of those are. Um, didn't wear anything of an animal nature, uh, thought that women were as equal as men, in most cases even more equaler. Um, didn't like blood sacrifice within religion, travelled as far as India to study yoga and various other uh, magical and religious philosophical practices. And really, in some respect, we had uh, 2,000 years of colonised Tyrias when he didn't send it to Jesus Christ, but we've got a place that uh, you know, it's the way things are, so we are where we are. But um, Levi is um, summoning the spirit of Polonius, uh, which itself opens up a few questions, really, because um, if reincarnation is a sort of fact, which I'm sure it is, we all know that it is. What was he actually summoning with the, the Polonius of the dead in the last 2,000 years? You know, in that time, he might come back several times. You know, who, 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 who can say? Or was it that it was his shade still hang, hanging around on the inner levels or something else masquerading? Or was it just Levi's imagination? However, I'm not really too bothered what it was. He still could have just polonized the answer that was polonized. Uh, that's good enough for me. Um, you might say, well, why is that? And that's probably because I wanted to be a polonized. Then we all. Um, but Levi talks about uh, touching the shade of the sword and he gets a, a numbed arm and he passes for a 
support devices and It's the only recorded act of necromancy. And yet, in some respects, it's not necromancy. We, are, we, we, we all think of this business of somebody dead and, and it all comes on this big, big umbrella of necromancy. What Levi was doing, and what I did, is actually skyromancy. Paul Houston makes, makes a difference. Necromancy, <coughs> if you read uh, Levi and one or two other sources, you'll see it. Really, it's animating the dead body, um, where, 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 where the dead person rises up and speaks to you and does what you want to do. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I have enough trouble with living there where the dead are time, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, I'll leave that one. But my idea of necromancy really is more skyromancy in practice for Paul Houston talks about speaking of Houston's um, ritual is quite detailed, and I want to go over that a little bit in a few minutes. But um, to uh, do respect to, uh, to uh, my other two partners in this great uh, crime, my grandmother Emma and my old teacher Ros, um, I'd just like to run over why and where it was and how they fit in. Roz, or uh, as I say, Rosemary Bruce, was a teacher that come from um, Essex. She'd been in Alexander's group, somebody else who's not far from me, uh, late 60s, early 70s. Um, she'd lost her job teaching in a Catholic school. In the news of the world, broke into the house and took photographs that I'd be good at. Uh, and of all places, she ended up living in a little place called Clun. Uh, high up on the world border in South West Shropshire. It's a backwater now, but it's more of a backwater then. I wouldn't go as far as say that um, if somebody had invented a wheelbarrow and then the road would be managed to walk, but uh, you're not far off if I say that. Really. And I'm at school a lot. But, um, however, putting that bit on one side, here I was as a child of 15, reading Man, Myth and Magic, reading Lord of the Rings, so uh, my grandchildren. Uh, an actual hobbit, I now can, can call it border things, uh, but I have to make some new one too. Um, but um, for me, somebody from the stable turning up, as I say, in this backwater was, uh, was like a great moment of faith, you know, in my life. Education at school, um, as good as it was up to a point, it actually sort of prepared me for the rest of my life in that sense. From now on, magic magic was my life. So banging on the door and announcing myself to hide, going off here, people tell me you're rich. She goes through the roof, how the bloody hell do they know? And uh, I think, well, it's kind of everybody now. What did that mean they invent? <laughs> I mean, I don't know how, what you guys know about the country side, but I haven't lived in it for pretty much in my life. Um, it's a great place. But the indigenous populations aren't that sensitive to the natural world that's around them. You know, it's nature is what it is. You know, people get killed, people die, animals get eaten. So what's your problem with the bank of the fox? Uh, it tends to be more of a county thing, really. That, that thing. But Roz was rather quite perturbed, however, than you. Never did find out how to I don't. I don't know. It's, it's the countryside. These things happen. So. She took me under a wing when I was 15, that's 1972, so save any getting brain ache, I'm making 57 in January. Um, and she taught me a lot. I'm like, pretty fortunate I had run the library, her experiences, and there's loads of stuff about magic. And um, that's several years of that, so I was right quite fortunate. But she took up uh, the champion up in Lancashire for a while, um, Ray Bogart, who was running uh, the Temple of the Prince, or the Temple of Blackwood. Uh, Luciferian grouping. Um, this was Luciferianism before it became popular today, on the magical circuit. Um, but she didn't stay that long. She left. She left some of the material. Started converting it into what she was doing with Sanders and Paul Cusin. By this time, I'm reading Brigadi. Uh, I'm getting obsessed with the Tree of Life that he wrote and Middle Pillar, and uh, it was really sort of uh, where I was at and what I was doing. And 
skin which is of course a technique of high magic, so not forgetting Barton as well. So these, 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 these were the areas that I was concentrating on which was doing around. We were still sort of doing stuff together as it were, so we were still sort of around. But we got to the point where I sort of sort of growing up and she was going around and doing what she was doing and I was moving on. But she's always been a part of my life in the sense of being my one of better way of putting it, my spiritual mother, as much as I owe, I owe her. She died in uh, New Year's Day, 1986. She was 54 and had a heart attack and sleep. That was that. Um, I, uh, in, 19, in the 1990s, um, I was very much into Gareth Knight's uh, two-volume dollar book. At this point, being a safe poor bastard. But uh, I actually got a lot from his work, and uh, I, I recommend it. Seriously interested in uh, in good basis and grounding and making practice of a lot more material in that. So, however, still at this point, I'm doing my own magical stuff. And then during the summer of 1997, first strange occurrences were happening, um, ideas were popping up, and I thought, you know, I'm really going to need to get hold of uh, Rose and she was here. Strange enough, I was living in the same street that she used to live in, and she'd been cremated and scattered in the garden, you know, it couldn't have been actually far from the car. So, um, just do what it means. <laughs> However, come uh, October 1997, uh, All Hallows falls just on that new moon period. And, I, and I'm thinking, this is it, I'm going to do this ritual. Studying Houston's work, writing it out. Preparation is a big part of magic. And um, I want to go into preparation a bit more right, because I'm second preparation. I was working with Houston's work in here. And I did email, managed to email him 10 years ago and had a little chat with him about one or two points on it, which he was good enough to come back and comment on. So I'd like to go over those at some point. So basically, the ritual um, starts off uh, two weeks prior. We have a photograph of the dead. You can make a shrine as an altar, candles, black cloth. What I did, burn some myrrh, appropriate incense. Um, and, you, uh, and for 10, 15 minutes every midnight, you're having a period of meditation on the photograph of the dead. We were to link to the dead person. Well, it sounds good talking about it in the daylight and sitting around here and then it sounds pretty good. But when you're there, you're doing it. Scared the crap out of you. And you can feel the person there, and the hairs on the back of your neck, and the shiver. You don't want to look around because you don't you don't want to look around. But uh, there's, there's a sense of someone there. And in some respects, Rod, she was good at what she did, magically. She was very good. Um, I'll give you a couple of quick points. When in 1975 there was um, a kidnapping in Shropshire, this girl gets kidnapped, and um, there's a big police hunt, couldn't find her. She's in contact with the family, offers to find, find the girl. Well, I was 17 at the time, and I was involved with this ritual. Um, she has uh, some belongings in the dead, uh, well, the dead, the missing girl. And her youngest son, during the course of this ritual, goes into a trance, is holding material, describes that the girl is dead, how she's died, and how she will be found. And didn't actually pinpoint the actual location in the sense it's that with reference so and so. But this did describe it accurately. Two days later, the cops found him the dead, just as he was making the strike. And at that point, I thought, you know, it's magic, that's where this, 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 this was magic. And there was a second occasion where she fell out with the publican. Um, there was some business that he was unpleasant to his wife, and he was there uh, in that crowd anyway. And um, she looked, was a little woman about five, Dorian Valley empty glasses, big nose, big black coat she always wore. Uh, and always a glass of red wine. Um, best people do. 
storms into tonight's pub, uh, tells him what to think, Paul Hewson, playing on the left foot, like that, saying you can be out within X amount of time. Strangely enough, he was sold out and went, just like that. And he was the talking for it. So she was somebody who could and did do stuff. And it wasn't, um, you know, stuff that you might be in the rally, not much of nothing in the material, but it, 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 it was what you saw a witch would have done. It was as simple as that. So, in some respects, as I say, it, was, it was a case of, where I'm concerned, perhaps of a fool rushing in for Angel to be his friend. And probably because um, I felt that um, this is what I could do, I wanted to do it, and two reasons for doing it, I was going to do it. However, I did live to tell the tale, so uh, I'm, still, I'm still here. Excuse me. What I'm going to do, just run over Hewson's ritual, just to refresh him with one of the mind blues. Um, not the bank. But I won't go all the way through it, I'll just run over the one or two um, points. You see, part, part, part of it, you're using your own blood in the incense, and I'll start with, um, which is fine, but when I got to my second ritual, uh, I did that one actually a bit different. Houston starts his necromancy ritual off three parts wormwood, two parts good quality church incense, two parts gun mastic, three parts litany of creed. Litany of creed is useful in incenses of evocation, like the triangle of art, because of the, the smoke that it gives off, um, good for materialising bodies. Uses half pint, half pint, sorry, half a part of olive oil, half pint part of wine. Half pint of honey, plus a few drops of the operator's blood. He tells you to mix it up and let it stand overnight um, so that it will sort of do what you need to do. When I came around to my second working, um, I didn't use it as an incense for the night, I simply just used 20 cents in there. And when, when it was being put on, I, with a sharp instrument, cut my hand so the blood dropped onto it. Blood gives off more power than magic. Big blast. I want to talk about power of blood, because I think somebody else is there later on. It's not my thing, really. But really, um, the life force that's within blood plays a big part in a lot of our time for work, which is just something for us. It's, it's nothing to do with this talk, I'm just sort of running out one part here. Um, the material in, that Houston is using. He says here that the summoning of the dead has always been considered by witches as among some of the most dangerous operations in the book. Strangely enough, sometimes even more so than the summoning of demons. He's actually got a point there. Um, I've had some experience working with ghost spirits and these Anokian angels and various kinds of spirits over, uh, over my time. Uh, sometimes into the showstone sometimes you just try and get a bar. It's, it's, it's demanding work. Um, but when it comes down to it, necromancy, I personally would prefer to work with ghost spirits rather than do necromancy rituals. I don't like them. I'm not comfortable with them. And I will never do another one ever again. I haven't done it yet. Uh, others will have to make their own money. There's, there's, there's an energy about it that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not personally comfortable with. Uh, maybe I don't have the temperament for it. But, you know, at the end of the day, you can't do everything. There's simply just not enough planetary hours in the day. So you, it's better to work with your strengths <coughs> in your life, perhaps, which is perhaps a bit of a cop out. If you don't have challenges in life and you don't push yourself a bit, or you're not going to be bad. Well, well, these things are true, but um, anyway, I haven't, haven't been there and done that. You know, I, 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 I'm seeing about what it can be about. Now, part of Houston's ritual, there's, um, you know, I wanted to run over. Part, 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 part of the ritual, you're um, 
doing everything backwards within a circle, we're going, you're going against the, the natural current in the sense of the, you know, um, clockwise and doing it all uh, with the shins. And, uh, and at one point, the room's plunged into darkness, and you've got your triangle of art there, and you're kneeling in front of it like this, saying your conjuration which you've got to learn from memory. And then you open your eyes, Build up was phenomenal. And it was scary, it was powerful. The two weeks preparation prior to that hadn't really prepared me for how things were going to be. In fact, an hour before the ritual at 11 o'clock, because this was work at midnight, and I waited for like the church clock to strike. An hour before the ritual, I had this tremendous, tremendous panic attack. I really didn't want to do this. I was getting to the point where I was really quite frightened. And I was starting to get myself worked up. I don't want to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do it. And then I stopped. It reminded me of uh, Roger's sayings about the laws of opposition will always challenge you. And I thought this was one of those times. And I said to myself, if you don't go and do this, if you don't see this through, in the morning, throw everything away, you can burn your books, snap your wand, out, and you can scrap everything and finish it. And so for me, this working actually became quite an initiation in its own life. Not one that you can actually go and buy off the shelf. This is something you have to go and do. Face your fears, face your fears, see them through. So, having given myself a magical pep talk prior to this, I'd, I'd been on fast for 24 hours, so maybe I started to feel a bit sort of nervous. I was on fasting with the second, the second ritual, so I don't want to get too, too much into that. Um, so, gathering myself and what I felt was left of my sanity. And getting on with this ritual, probably one of those great magical moments in my own personal life that what scared the shit out of me at the time. I'm immensely grateful for. Having said that, when we're back in the circle and we've gone through the Tucson's ritual, part of the ritual, he says, part of your uh, application, by the mysteries of the deep, by the flames of Banal, by the power of the east, and by the silence of the night, by the holy rites of Hecate, I conjure and exercise thee, O spirit, X, Y, Z, to present thyself here and answer truly our demand. So it be. Now, this intrigued me because I thought, where did Houston actually get this from? I mean, there's various stories about Houston. Some of them I come across. Um, he was in a group up in Staffordshire. Um, he, in an email, he told me that he was servants of light, the old fortune, both Gareth Knight. So maybe he wrote this book perhaps as an antidote for his time. These guys. <laughs> I, I don't know about that. Um, there had been various bits and pieces. And it intrigued me where he got the material from. And fairness, he'd certainly done his research with the whole corpus. What's the say it's about press in some quarters? If it, well, you don't have to be particularly clever, but if you're magically savvy, you can pick stuff out of there and adapt it. So it's a good source for it. So going back to his um, education there, you can see where it's come from. Wake used it in um, his book on ceremonial magic. Uh, A.E. Waite, Crowley often referred to as dead weight. Um, you can also see it taken out of uh, Barrett's Majors. Uh, Fifty years before um, slavery abolished, he was campaigning to get rid of it. He, he, was, he was in Bristol, where else would he start campaigning against slavery? 
trying to get slavery banned, and the African sent back to Africa with the money, the education, the tools, and the means to develop the country. So he was far ahead of his time in that sense. Of course, you've got to remember when they did vote for slave, uh, get them to uh, slavery, the bishops of the Church of England actually voted to keep it. That's one was threatened to. So, Sibley listed that, I suspect, in dear old um, Reginald Scott's discovery of witchcraft, uh, where he got to and other things together. So that invitation that Hewson's using is a long time on the use. And I, and, I, and I bring this back to your attention for the simple reason the material that's got a long life like this has its own measure, has its own energy. And somewhere on the subtle levels there's all that emotion, fear, hate, love, whatever, you, whatever it is. There's a reservoir of energy that sort of pulls around words, power, uh, sigils that you see in books, uh, and all these things. So in their own sense, they're sacred and they actually have a life of their own. And the, mag the, mag the magician, the magical worker, the witch can, as we all know, plug into these currents and work with them the best or the worst. So, I'm in the circle, dark, and I'm kneeling down, excuse me, direct. You get that moment you open your eyes. And what did I expect to see? Did I expect to see Rod standing there? Half, half I did. I wouldn't be too sure what I want, what I was going to see. But it's at this moment there's a real sense, not only the atmosphere that you can actually cut with a magical sword, let alone a knife. It was oppressive, it was tense. It was like something I've never really experienced ever before. But there's, you, you, there's a sense of the room that was sort of maybe just dark, sort of spinning, and there's these lights flickering around the circle. Maybe it's just imagination, I don't know what it was. But it's definitely there, because I'm, I'm going like this. There was no, as far as aware, I didn't see an individual within the triangle, probably just as well. I think the working was spoiled in some respect by my own fear an hour prior to that. I feel what it for some of its energy. But which is one of the reasons why I think the second row was actually a lot better. But I said what I needed to say, I asked what I needed to ask for. And within a few weeks, that which I was interested in comes my way. Things happen. So I thought, well, whether I picked up on what you were, because I would only consider myself to be moderately excited. Um, Mary does most of the strife, but I'm not better at it than I am. But women generally are the more receptive. I wouldn't say all women are, I wouldn't say all men were, but by and large, it's female art in my experience. Um, but having said this, and having um, gone through this experience, I felt so relieved that I'd come out the other side. And over the weeks, that which I wanted to know starts to manifest. The curious thing is, 12 months later, to the very, very day, the following All Hallows, I'm walking past her house. I'm thinking about what happened to her father. And there's one of her children standing at the door there. And I hadn't seen him for 20 odd years. And this chap turns around, looks at me, and I swear to the gods that it was his mother's voice that I heard that said, re looked at me and said, remember me to Gary, and just walks off. And I sit down there. And it was great sort of shiver, you know, you feel like it's God. You know, it was, it was like the conclusion to the work in that sense. So, um, 10 years ago, um, during an email conversation with um, Paul Hewson about, about his book, and I wanted to discuss, to be to discuss the, the work. I think he was rather intrigued that actually somebody worked with him. But um, there was a couple of points with his email that I want to read at you. 
it says here, you don't mention whether your worker is one of intelligence or amatory. What he's referring to, of course, is the dumb supper. She Ross said to me, she didn't really approve of necromancy, which uh, would respond to a dumb supper. But I don't know if you know about the dumb supper where Houston has this ritual based on preparing a meal for the dead, and you go back to the kitchen backwards, and you bring everything out of the house backwards, and you lay the table backwards, and uh, you, have, you have a picture of the dead person sitting there, and you're all sitting at the other end, and he says, you don't have to put too much food on their plate because the dead are light eaters. Um, maybe, maybe that might be the best way. But anyway, so anyway, he says, in case of both, they require a very specific mindset to get results. You have to be both motivated and goal orientated. That is, have a reason for the performing of the ritual. Well, uh, that's pretty obvious, really. But anyway, glad you said it. Curiosity is never enough to affect the change in consciousness of the operator. Most folk, amongst whom I include myself, do not aim at physical phenomena. I'll just stop that one. The thing is conjuration. You know, having a conjuration of a spirit or whatever into the triangle of art, everybody's, well, I'm not saying it, but a common perception that you will need to have a physical manifestation. These things can happen. I mean, I, I, I've had times when working with planetary spirits uh, when I was in Wales, where the seal of the spirit will hang over the triangle of art. And I'm going to put it away and gone back into the room the next day. It's on the floor in chalk outside the triangle. And I'm thinking, how the hell did that get there? But um, that is not unknown. I mean, there's, there's one or two writers like Zuleski and Longy Kerr mentioned that. Uh, Basically, you're going for a magical result. So long as long, long as you feel somebody's there, and they do what you want to do, and you get the result, what's the good deal? Yeah, I, 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 I think there's something in that one, but you know, that's, that's rather to make up your own mind about. So Houston's saying here is that you need a special type of constitution for this, and the Yuri Gellers and Matthew Mannings of the world are very rare. So any manifestation would have been within your consciousness. And that is why motivation and magical intention is so important to provide a mold or a form for the force in both. So, really, at the end of the day, preparation is probably nine tenths of magic in some sense. Preparation of the operator, preparation of the gay, if you like. All this stuff. Focus consciousness. As Crowley talks about the will, the will rules supreme in magic. It's the will that empowers your magic through the planes to spur realization, manifestation on the physical level. Willpower is probably the most important piece of magical equipment you've got. No will, no power. As I wrote in the Noctis years ago, You've got to make up your mind whether you actually got a, a wishbone or a backbone. And that's what I'm referring to. Okay. Yeah, it's true. So, all those things undermine your will. Like breaking your word, not seeing things through. All undermine, undermine you subtly at a magical level. I mean, Houston talks about this sometimes. Um, don't give your word unless you can actually see it through, he said. Which is a fair point, but I mean, sometimes the universe inspires that you can't see things through. We've all broken our word over things in time. It's not a good magical habit. So maybe you should be a bit basic, like they are where I get up in Shropshire, with indigenous populations sit on fences, with the fence, winning side and come down on the winning side. Um, and to say about the Welsh, they pray on their knees on Sunday and they pray on one another the rest of the week. <laughs> Some truth in that. So that's 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 Houston. <laughs>